I'm from <laughs> Turkey. No, don't worry. I have another box here. <laughs> uh, can you just take one and pass it around? Uh, I'm from Turkey. I'm working at the Turkish uh, Standards Institute as a penetration tester. I'm also in charge of the National Vulnerability Program and things like that. Uh, well, I'm not a hacker, just that's what I'm trying to say. I'm a penetration tester. And when I visit customers talking about cyber attacks and uh, web application attacks, I sometimes have customers that show me this map saying that this is you know, what they think the cyber war or the cyber attacks are. But in reality, as most of you know, cyber attacks are mostly like this. And we just a few minutes ago, we have seen that the Albanian cyber army has uh, given a reply to this attack. So it's basically like, you know, <laughs> kids at play. Uh, in my part of the world, we have things like, you know, uh, Operation Israel or Op Turkey uh, once every while. And news like that saying that 700 Israeli websites have been hacked and, you know, PayPal accounts and social media accounts have been leaked. Well, it's impressive. And they usually, there is a list like this saying that, okay, these are the sites that we have hacked, quote unquote. Well, when we look at these sites, we see that, you know, these are mostly poor companies just trying to do business like, you know, we would. And how come such a thing, such a political thing has an impact? That's uh, one of the things that we might need to ask ourselves. The reason is that when a website gets hacked, it has several serious impacts. It's not like you might crash a server somewhere and nobody will notice it. You know, you might lose your accounting database, no one will notice. But when you deface a website, for example, when we ch you change the website saying that this has been hacked by me for whatever reason, then the whole world sees it and it has a direct impact on your reputation as a company, as a country, whatever you are. We see that in some cases it also has a, uh, it results in data leaks. So your customer data, your company data, your government data leaks out there. If you have any other stuff, it can be anything. It can be another server, it can be uh, another website. If you have anything running on the same server, it will also get hacked because you, know, lo you lost that server. Uh, it happens to me once in a while, one of my customers saying, for example, the, the Ministry of uh, education calls me saying that the Ministry of Health is attacking them. Of course, there's no such a thing. It's just someone who has control over the systems of that ministry that is using it to attack other parties. So you can find yourself blacklisted without even knowing why, just because of this. And of course, your user accounts, if there are any user accounts on that particular server, will get hacked. So if it's so crucial, then why don't we protect it, you can ask. Well, we do try to protect it. Uh, what we are using is this layered approach to security. We think that, you know, attacks coming from the internet and we, what we are trying to do is to build ourselves a safe environment. It can be a safe server, it can be safe users, whatever it is. We are trying to build this uh, safe environment for ourselves. And we have, you know, a step-by-step -step or uh, approach to security, which in fact hasn't changed much since the Middle Ages. So in the Middle Ages, if I wanted to protect my castle, what I would do is use this exact same layered approach, one layer after the other of security, trying to stop the enemy, saying that, okay, if they breach one, they will get stopped uh, by the other. It's exactly how we think things are today. You know, we have a firewall saying that this will attack some of the, this will stop some of the attacks. We have our intrusion prevention system, our URL filtering, our anti-spam solution. All this, we think that uh, one or the other will stop the attacker. Our problem is that the attacker doesn't come, you know, just like Braveheart going to, <laughs> trying to attack your castle. No, they just pop somewhere in your network or in your systems just out of nowhere. And the reason is that, uh, well, the things they attack, you cannot 
exactly protect them as much as you like. Say that this is our web application. It's pretty much how it would be. You have an operating system, a web, a web server running somewhere, an application, maybe a database. And you want the whole world to reach your web application. You, know, you want to be the next Facebook. You want to be the next Twitter. You want to earn you know, millions of euros with your web application. So you want the whole world to be able to reach it. You also want your admin users to reach it. You know, some people should have different uh, authorizations and authority on the system. But you are trying to avoid these guys reach your solution, which you know, it's the root of our problem. Say this is our web application, the, the application we're trying to protect, abc.com slash display and product ID, something like that. When we look at this address, just we have just seen, every part of this address touches a different part of uh, this, in fact, the arch architecture you are trying to protect. So just with this URL, the attacker is directly able to reach, in fact, everything you are trying to protect. So what do we do? We try to stop them with firewalls. And we know that a firewall, all you can do, or uh, in the proper sense of firewalls, all you can do uh, is block either the source IP, the destination IP, the protocol, or the port. And in our case, since we are trying to protect a web application, none of these would work. We, we cannot block source IPs because we want the whole world to reach it. We cannot block the destination IP because, well, it's what we are trying to show the world. And we cannot block the port or the protocol because that's how our visitors, our uh, legitimate visitors, will reach us. So we have a problem. We can try to stop them with an IPS or IDS, intrusion prevention system, intrusion detection system. We can show these machines or these appliances that, OK, if you see this starting with script, ending with script, this is a cross-site scripting attack. So block it, don't let, let it pass. Again, our problem here is that this is also a cross-site scripting attack, and it's not using the script tags. So there's more than one way to attack uh, a web application. So how do we try to secure our web applications? With penetration testing. That's what I do. Are there any penetration testers here today? You are a penetration tester? Oh, great. great. OK. So the idea of the penetration tester is you know, someone who thinks like an attacker, you know, someone who has the capabilities of a hacker, but is not a hacker, someone that you know, <laughs> prefers to work with a pay rather than hacking a bank. And this think like an attacker idea is something I want to show you just uh, to have a, an understanding how things would work. OK. Um, this is an application that was developed so that people you know, can learn these skills, then vulnerable web application. You can just download it and install it on your own uh, systems. It would avoid you to go to jail or <laughs> any other problems since you wouldn't have to attack anyone's uh, systems. So say that our application, you know, our, our million euro idea, is that we let people send pink packets for free. And you know, this will work. Yeah. So when we look at this, we say, okay, nice idea, cool and when an attacker looks like at this exact same thing, he sees a Linux system. He says, well, maybe there's some Linux box running in b behind it, and maybe I can reach it and use it to whatever end I wish. So to understand if it's the case, maybe I can just try to send a uh, command. No, it doesn't seem to work. Or maybe list what is in my directory. doesn't work either. Maybe just to list my present working directory? No. It looks like Linux commands do not work. So this is where normally we would stop. But what the attacker would do is it, he or she would try to understand if your security solutions really work. So I don't know. Here, yeah. Thank you. So what he does or she does is first put that IP address to which you want to send the ping packet. And then with pipe, follows it with a Linux command. See if 
if it will work now. Yes, so we know that the security solution or whatever the developer thought he had put is just, you know, check if it is an IP address. That's all they are checking. So that's nice. We can, you know, enumerate uh, the content or, you know, list. <laughs> well, I'm glad it's not IPv6. Okay. So, but if I'm a penetration tester and I come to you saying that, okay, you have a vulnerability like this on your system, maybe it will not, be in, it will not look very important. It happened to me once. I finished a penetration testing at a ministry, and I was saying that, okay, it took us half an hour to become domain administrator. That's important? Yes? No? Yeah. And the guy, who, the IT <laughs> director, he was like, uh, sir, I have another meeting in 10 minutes. Is there something important you want to tell me? <laughs> okay. I, 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 you know, I was thinking it was important, but to him it meant nothing. Then I had to rephrase saying that, yes, we can read everybody's email in this ministry, and then things got more interesting. So to show that this is really an attack, maybe what we can do is to show the full extent of it. Oh, yeah. So what I will try to do now is download a backdoor, see if I can download a, a file that would... Of course, I will not download the backdoor now, because we have lots of things to talk about, but just see if I can download any file. If everything goes as planned, see if uh, the file I tried to download was uh, trojan.txt. Just let's see if it is there. Yes, it was indeed downloaded. Just let me show it from the command line of my other machine. So this is the machine I'm attacking. And as you can see, it is here. OK. So this is to, to give an idea about how the hackers, or the attackers as we call them, think. But penetration testing was not an idea put forward by hackers, obviously. It was you know, based on more historical events. The first event is this gentleman's idea of Kriegspiel, which, you know, as you know better than me, means war game. So it's just uh, wooden blocks that you played around on a map. These were you know, supposedly military units. And we know that today armies use the same uh, technique. They are using many sim techniques similar, you know, from simulation to concrete military maneuvers. And, well, I'm you've seen this movie, right? <laughs> no, nobody has seen it here. I, I made a similar, I also provide training, and I was giving a training at the uh, Turkish uh, Air Force, and you know, it was a similar sized uh, class, around 200 people, and I asked, okay, did you see the movie? And they all raised their hand. In fact, it was in their course. They seen it at the academy. So, In one of the scenes in that movie, the trainer comes in and says, okay, uh, guys, we were doing very good during the Korean War. Our pilots were flying perfectly. And before one of our, we, lose, we lost any of our planes, we would take down around 12 enemy planes. But when we w came to the Vietnam War, things have changed a bit. It, the ratio fell to one to third, and that's why we uh, created this uh, Top Gun school of you know, pilots. I, I would just wanted to check this fact, if, see if it was true. So I thought maybe the planes the North Vietnamese army was using were better than what the Americans were using. That would explain a lot of things. And when, when we look at the planes that the US Air Force used, we see F-8s, heavy planes, hard, difficult to maneuver, A-4s, which are lighter and uh, faster. But the things were similar for the Vietnamese army. They had one plane that was heavy, the other plane that was lighter, and you know, it was the same situation. Luckily, the US Army asked the same question to this gentleman, and uh, Captain Frank Alt, and he has written a huge report, say, uh, we know it as the Fr Alt report, he came up with three in interesting problems. The first one is that you know, the guys who 
quote the cheapest price are producing our planes and our weapons. So sometimes they don't work because it's the cheapest thing you can find on the market, which is normal. The second problem is that our rules of engagement, the rules that tell us how we will fight this war, date from the Second World War, and it, they are not suitable to what we are doing today. And the, the third one was that we are providing symmetrical training to our pilots. So that's the main reason that we are failing. Symmetrical training is basically when you have a pilot, uh, a pilot flying a plane you know, for uh, training. The plane that will pretend to be the enemy has pretty much the same uh, specification. So if it's a heavy plane, the enemy will be represented with a heavy plane. If it's a lighter plane, the same thing. But, you know, as you would think, as you, you would understand, in the real war, the enemy is not so considerate. You know, if they see you have a disadvantage, they will, you know, go for it. And, you know, after this report, many armies around the world have started using what we call asymmetrical training. So in all the scenarios, in all the training scenarios, our forces or our army is disadvantaged compared to the enemy. And based on uh, these guys' idea, they came up with the Tiger Team. The Tiger Team was uh, na the, a part of the US Navy, uh, ex-SEALs commandos, and they were going from base to base around the world trying to infiltrate them and you know, writing reports saying that, okay, this is how we did it and these are your security vulnerabilities. But when it comes to computers, the first time the term was used, it was in 19... 67 and well just to cut the history <laughs> brief the first penetration test was conducted in 1971 for the United States Army uh, the Air Force the statement of work was very simple find a vulnerability in our systems exploit it and you know tell us how you did it did it so we can uh, you know take the measures so why do we need, in fact, we have seen what these are, but why, why do we need penetration tests? Well, there are several reasons. The, the first and most important reason is that we need to test our attack vectors. So just a few minutes ago, we have seen that you know, there was an uh, interface that allowed me to send ping packets. Yeah, this can be an attack vector, but would I, will I be able to download a file or a backdoor? This is something I had to test. We also need to understand the situation, the security situation as a whole. So I cannot just say that, okay, you have this part that is wrong and so that your whole uh, security stance is uh, futile, you are um, insecure. I cannot say that. I have to test this as a whole. And, well, I have to do things past vulnerability scanners, obviously, because you can just start a vulnerability scanner. It will give you false positives, it will give you false negatives, and yeah, you will have a report, but it's not really what the attacker will do. And also, what people are paying uh, penetration testers is to see the impact of this attack or any attack on their businesses. So for them, they don't care if they have an MS-0867 somewhere. They want to know if they will lose money or, you know, reputation or uh, someone will die. This is, in fact, the question they are trying to answer. Uh, and penetration test also <laughs> remediates to one kind of blindness that we have in our life. Is anyone colorblind here? Uh, really? Um, so am I. Uh, good. <laughs> so for those who are not co colorblind, you can see the two here and the 14 here. And then we have night blindness. You know, people that can see, cannot see very well when the light is dim or, you know, not ideal. We have banner blindness, which just entered the literature. It's, you, you have it, yeah. The banner blindness or the other one? Yeah, okay. What is it, sir? So, uh, you, you were born with Ed Block then, huh? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, okay, that's yeah, good. And then we have security blindness, which is, you know, the reason we are doing penetration tests, because when you are in charge of the same system for years and years and years, there are things you start not seeing. For example, things I see during the test, they enter a firewall rule just for a test, and they forget it. And, you know, 
the first rule of the firewall becomes any to any allow, and that's how they use it for years until we start a penetration test. Just to give you an idea, it happens. Uh, the Falkland War in 1982. So Britain and Argentina fought for this small island. And the most critical part of the war was this uh, airport at Rio Grande, which was the base that the Argentinians used to uh, conduct the war. And the Argentinians thought that, yeah, okay, the, the British army will try to get hold of this airport because it's a strategic airport. And so they took all the measures they could. They put people on the coast, they put people on the Chilean border just to avoid any infiltration. But the plan on the British army side, since it's an airport, they would just load their commandos on a plane and land it directly on the airport. So this is a scenario that the Argentinian stuff didn't think about. So when we are doing penetration tests, <laughs> is this what really we're doing? Like, you know, a hacker from the movies? Unfortunately not. What we are doing is much more boring. We are doing a risk assessment. So we have to show the customer or to make the customer understand that there are risks and, you know, to give him a proper list yeah, of risks. And when it comes to web applications, the criteria or the standard we can use is uh, Open Web Application Security Project, or WASP. They have a whole checklist and uh, lots of documents on uh, the web application security. It's a good resource. And what they also publish from time to time is this top 10. So these are the top 10 attacks that target directly web applications. So in the list in 2010 and 2013, you see that not much has changed. So this really shows that we can really not, we still cannot say that our web applications are secure. Cross-site scripting was first discovered in 1996. Anyone born in 96 here? No, really? After 96? No? Yeah. Okay, so this vulnerability is older than you. But we, we still have it, we still have it. So how does a website or a web application get hacked? The, f the main reason, of course, is insufficient security. So no one patches their web server, they get hacked, it's normal. They have wrong installation and configuration. You just install an IS software. What you do is click next, 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 is install, and you think your system is secure. That's wrong. Software vulnerability, people who developed the software don't care about security, they don't care about user input or sanitization, things like that. Default install, as I said, is uh, a nightmare. You have unpatched software, so you are using IS 6.0, everything works on your website, why update it, yeah? <laughs> why bother? The default username and uh, password, every a piece of equipment you can buy or any software, most of the software, they have default username and password. When you buy them the first day, there's a username password. If you don't change it, it's uh, asking for trouble. And unnecessary services, you have an FTP running on your web server, right? but you are not using FTP at all. Happened to you, sir? You, you, you discover things like that, yeah? Of course, wrong authorization. You have a web server running with uh, domain admin credentials, things like that. Leaving backup files on the same server in one of my customers, which happens to be a ministry, they have backed up all their emails for the last 10 years and put that backup on a publicly accessible directory. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the admin panel easily reachable, yes, because just a normal user or software developer, when he sees that username and password, he thinks that nobody can get through, but you know, we know that that's not how hackers think. So if you find the admin panel, it's much easier for you to uh, compromise the system. We don't use still SSL, especially on the intranet. Nobody uses it, and also our public-facing uh, systems most of the time. The user control is not done properly. So if, I, if one of our users enters his credentials wrong three times, 30 times, 300 times, nobody locks them out. And we tend to be, you know, a bit uh, lazy on security. We are always trying to make systems that are easier to use compared to systems that are more secure. Okay, just went through this. 
OWASP gives us six steps to understand the uh, risk on any system. So our first step is obviously to identify the risk. We as a tester need to understand what can go wrong. We also need to understand what are the odds that it can go wrong. So uh, it's like I sometimes compa compare to a house fire. Okay, we have a house. It can, there are things inside that can burn. We just need to understand, okay, these things that can burn, how far they are from a fire source, and also what are the odds that these two will get together. Um, the likelihood is uh, a bit critical, you know, can the floor here burn? Yes. What is the likelihood? Well, it depends on many things. So the likelihood is a bit based on uh, experience and uh, past uh, attacks, maybe. So we have two main issues. What we have seen just with the demo uh, is that there was a vulnerability. And in that case, I was the threat agent. So if you have built the same application and it's running locally on your own uh, computer, it's not you know, talking to the internet just even for s sending ping packets, then since you would not have any uh, threat agent, it would be considered more secure than if it was open uh, to the internet. So you can have the same vulnerability with different effects. And when something goes wrong, when the system gets quote-unquote hacked, you have you know, the technical impact, yes, you are losing that server, but there's also the business impact. In in Turkey, we had this huge drill where we simulated a cyber war, you know, just like the one that happened in Estonia in 2007. Remember this? No? Russia, Russia attacked Estonia, and it was a huge uh, denial of service, distributed denial of service attack. So, you know, Turkey asked the same question, what would happen if we received the same attack? And, well, I was working one of the telecom operators back then, there were nine operators that uh, participated and 12 operators that failed because you know, even the guys who did the test failed. But you know, this is a technical impact. If your line, if your internet connection doesn't work, this is a technical impact. But uh, what happened is that at the end of this uh, drill, we had this huge meeting with the minister and the minister was talking to the press saying that, okay, Turkey is ready for cyber war or whatnot. And a news broke saying that the Turkish airlines were hacked. So just as, you know, it's huge impact on reputation because the, ministry, the minister is there talking and he's not able to protect his own system. But in fact, no one got hacked. The Turkish Airlines received a denial of service attack and temporarily the site was offline, but the impact was, you know, a huge loss of reputation. And then we start digging into all these Excel files and uh, graphics these are you know, mostly uh, the boring part. And then we have to decide what to fix. Uh, just, a uh, I think it was last year, we had this huge vulnerability on Linux systems, ghost vulnerability. Yeah. And I emailed all my, all my customers saying that this is huge, please update as soon as possible. <laughs> and uh, 10 minutes later, I received a call from a customer. You know, he started shouting directly. I said, okay, calm down, what happened? There were, they had uh, this Linux server running from since he doesn't know when, and they updated it, and now it, does, it didn't work anymore. So <laughs> you have to be careful deciding what to fix. It's not, you know, you cannot write, uh, or we cannot write a penetration testing report saying, okay, you need to update all this. We can write it, but it would not be, you know, yeah, feasible. It would not be realistic. And then, of course, you will add factors of your own. if. We are talking about a door manufacturer, like we have seen. Uh, well, does it have any factors? But if we are talking about a bank, then yes, they have other factors. They have uh, regulations, maybe, or they have more critical systems than just a website. Okay, we will... Uh, I will not go into that. A vulnerability we know is uh, anything that can go wrong with the system. Tomorrow I have another talk about exploit development, then we will go more in details on this if you are interested. And a threat is the hacker, the bad guy, the denial of service, whatever you call it, and well, the test methodology, of course.
again, we cannot do the test just you know like we uh, like a hacker. The hacker, what he wants is to get in, steal money, or you know steal data. But we have to be able to show the customer a broader picture, a, a more complete picture. So we cannot just go in, dive in, and attack everything. We need to follow a, a methodology. And here, the methodology uh, you can see this on uh, OWASP website starts with information gathering and goes all the way to client side testing. Information gathering, in fact, we can divide it into two uh, separate areas. The first one is uh, what we would call open source intelligence, so everything that is open to the internet, accessible but e by everyone, and uh, more you know, active reconnaissance that where we would directly uh, touch the systems. And there are lots of things you can learn about a system without even touching it. So without even uh, sending all these hacker <laughs> tools, you can gather information. Anyone know what this file is? Yeah, exactly. It, this, files, this file, this robots.txt, tells search engines not to uh, index whatever is in here. So this might be admin panels, this might be backups, this might be my test environment. I don't want Google to show the whole world my admin panel. So what I do is I put it here so that Google cannot index it. So the, the guys who are Googling for uh, dorks, you know, Google dorks, or uh, they find something in Google hacking database, there are things like that where we use, uh, that we use to find vulnerabilities. So that this GovTR site for Google will not have an administrator uh, panel. But in fact, what this list is, well, it tells me as a hacker or as a penetration tester just to look here, don't bother looking anywhere else. This is you know, what's important. This is where the meat is. So let's look at administrator. Yes, we have an admin panel. Same thing, they are using uh, open source, something. all the addresses are GovTR, so these are places, I'm using GovTR examples because these are places you would think that are better protected than you know, your door manufacturer. Again, here, uh, the web server is configured not to list this directory. Okay, good, they have a security measure, but here, it's not very visible, I have the exact uh, path of the, where the file is. So it starts with D slash hosting space and it goes all the way to www root. And it tells me that you know the web server has some configurations. Again, another one. Here it tells me that the request filtering module does not allow me to go there. Okay, fine. But two things. I know that there is a f module or something in between that is filtering my uh, packets or what I, I'm sending. This is the first thing, and again, I have the perfect path. Again, an admin panel. Anyone has money in this bank? No? <laughs> okay, same thing here. Well, I'm a bit thick with the language, but I would suppose test or entitled document uh, does not show well. Okay. This is an example of things that companies put on the web without even noticing. I I've just written a short Python script. What it does, it's, uh, it will just, uh, it's how you, you would write alive in Turkish. Well, the name, that's where it comes from. So what it does, I give it an IP block, and it goes IP from IP, just sending a packet to port 80. And it tells me that something is running there. So this is a test I have done for one of the largest uh, technology companies in Turkey. They have a server here, test. They have another one under construction. They have VMware. Here, well, service cannot be reached, so on and so forth. Okay, but it tells me that I can contact my SAP team if I have any problem. So by visiting this place, I know that they are using SAP inside the company. And then they have their own private cloud open again to the internet. And this is a, a 
user interface that allows me to send queries directly to their SAP system. They are using it to track uh, cargo or whatever parcels, but it's open to the internet. The system administrator thinks that since you know it's hidden and Google doesn't index it and nobody knows about it, that no one will find it. And of course the VPN. So basically, if we use it for an example here, RIPE will tell me the IP block of any company. And well, what Alive does, it, it returns the HTTP uh, codes. So 200 for OK, 400 if something went wrong. OK, this is the main site. I don't know what this is. Is it something that should be on the internet or no? What is it? No, it's uh, admin panel, something like that. And then, of course, you have your <laughs> default. So th that's not all, uh, of course. You can, Baidu.com is one of the largest, I think, the largest uh, website in China, so which makes it quite huge in the world as well. And in 2010, people who just went on the internet and wrote www.baidu.com were faced with this uh, page. So it says that the Iranian cyber army hacked Baidu.com. What happened, in fact, is that nobody hacked, nobody, nobody hacked, in fact, anything that belonged to Baidu. What they did, they found a vulnerability in one of their DNS servers, so domain name servers, and they changed it to point it to one of the sites they made, they created somewhere else. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So when we look at DNSs, okay, yeah, we, ha we see that there are DNSs. But one of the attacks we can conduct on DNS servers, it's not really an attack, but we can just try domain name transfer, which would list all the subdomains that this uh, bank has. So this is not something you want to see on the internet. And well, ns2.posted.co failed, so it was configured properly, but ns1 wasn't configured properly. So I hope nobody from this bank is working, nobody here is working in this bank. <laughs> And of course, paste pin, where you can directly find login and passwords. <laughs> so these are all information that is publicly available. I didn't have to hack anything. Most of the time, I didn't even have to touch anything that belonged to that bank. So this is what we would call information gathering. The second step, step is to see if everything on the networks is working as it should. So if the web server works as it should, if you know any other is there anything that goes wrong? The HTTP methods, so what we are using normally when we are browsing the internet is get and post two methods, but there are other methods like delete, put, options, methods like this that should not be uh, openly usable. We check things like that. So just on the network side, see if they have a WAF. WAF is a web application firewall these are systems that we would use to stop attacks coming to our web application. So as we have seen, a normal firewall would, that would block only attacks that come from the network and for the network. But this is a more clever thing. It would block attacks. Uh, there's a basic tool uh, called Woof Woof, which, will, which tells me you know, if the target is using a web application firewall or not. No WAF detected for these guys. Okay, These guys are using an IBM web application security, a web application firewall. So you might think that this is not important. There are two reasons this is important. First, now I know that someone is watching what I'm doing. So I will, not, uh, I will be more careful. And second, as I know what exactly is watching me, and if I'm familiar with this, you know, these solutions, they have their database of known attacks. So the IBM, this uh, IBM solution will recognize certain types of SQL injection and not recognize other types. So if I know what is trying to protect them, I know what I'm against. And this one, this solution was not very sure. So maybe it's using something else. Okay. we. Also test for authentication, bless you. 
and authorization, things like that, how are sessions handled, and the input validation. Input validation is where the good stuff is. Input validation, well, normally, you know, if I just try to go to kbm.rs, you know, what I see on my URL is IBM, uh, kbm.rs. But the system, without me knowing, is sending tons and tons of other data. So I have this user agent. I can have cookies if I'm logged in or if it has assigned me a, a cookie value. I can have lots of things. SQL injection is uh, the vulnerability that does the most damage because what it does, in fact, it allows the attacker to talk directly to the database. So I can delete records, add records, change records, whatever I feel like. Yeah, exactly. Just maybe to show you how this works, going back to our... Uh, yeah, for example, this is, uh, again, somewhere I can just query the database. You know, I say one, it finds a user. I say two, it finds another user. So this is how it works. And as a hacker now, let's see if I can get anything out of this. Just let me open my cheat sheet so I don't make any mistakes writing and save your time. First of all, I want to understand if there is really an SQL injection, because the SQL injection is not a vulnerability of the database, it's not a vulnerability of the uh, server, it's a mistake that people who have coded this application have made. So they think that here, since they are expecting a user ID, people will only send user IDs, so it, people will send one, two, things like that. But, you know, I'm a bad guy, so why bother sending what he wants? I'm sending a code, a single code. And here, it tells me that something went wrong. To you, it can just look like a normal uh, error message. But here, as an attacker, I know that the single code has created a problem with the query. So let's see if I can get anything out of this. My next query will be a bit different. I will just copy and paste it. OK. What I say here is, OK, just put a single code. Or is 0 equal to 0? That's what the question I'm asking. See, if he thinks that zero, if 0 is equal, equal 0, he is so happy that 0 is equal 0 that he has given me the whole database. So good. How can we exploit this? Let's see if I can get some information. I'm, again, he will give me everything. What I want is the version. Yes, he has given me the version. Maybe I can try to see what user it is running under. Again, so just to clarify, again, is 0 equals 0? Yes. And I'm using union here. Union is a SQL uh, queries term, just, to, uh, just like the pipe we have seen. And yes, it's running as root on localhost. Where can this take me? I will just you know, save some of your precious time. Where we can go is basically here. I want all the users, and as you will see, the magic word here, I want their passwords. And here, the database keeps the passwords hashed, so I don't have them clear text, but I was able to dump usernames and password for everyone that is on that database. This is one example of user input. The other example might be uh, cross-site scripting, just as we have seen. No, in fact, cross-site scripting is, uh, a, again, a vulnerability that allows me to run JavaScript code on this system. So just to see if the vulnerability is here, maybe they are using a web application firewall or something. So if I write script, alert script, you know, what uh, the document tell me, he will understand that I'm 
attacking it. So maybe I will use something more simple and stupid. I will just send the HTML tag, plain text. Yes, as you can see, it has uh, accepted the plain the tag, the HTML tag, as a command. Ah, sorry, what it does normally is, well, I give him a name and he says, hello. So that's what it was supposed to do. But now I see that it does more than that. And what it does is, as I said, allows me to run code. And, well, this is not a very in uh, inspiring example. Where I would use this is, if I can write it correctly, instead of you know, putting random words, I would go for document. Oops, because that's document cookie. So this is my document cookie. Anyone can tell me what cookies do? Uh, is it uh, important or no? Yes. This is how the server knows if I'm logged in or not. So, okay, I know that I'm, you know, a user, and this is my own uh, cookie. That's not very interesting. Where it becomes interesting is if I can find a stored cross-site scripting. So my username is this. Again, I will go for uh, here. Oops. Just let me write on the here first. Let's see if it will work. Okay. I just signed the guest book. Okay. So now anyone that visits this web page will get its uh, cookie stolen. So this is how we would use this attack. Again, you know, from uh, maybe administrative point of view, it's not important. It's just a cross-site scripting, but the impact is that you know most of your customers or uh, users will lose their uh, accounts. Uh, okay, and the other guys, of course, we have to understand the business logic. If there's a flaw in the business logic, or if you know it's, uh, for example, suitable to brute force attacks, we can just again check brute force attacks, see if they work. Uh, okay, I have a login screen here. First, let me turn off, uh, turn on Burp Suite. So what I, I will do here is try to guess the user, if you know I can guess correctly. And to be able to do that, I need something that would help me send all these guesses. I will use Burp Suite, and I will, yeah, okay, this is Burp Suite, and I will just configure my. so that it will use a proxy. Okay. So everything from now on I'm sending to... Uh, to that website will first come to my proxy. My proxy will block it and then if I allow it to go through, it will go through. So let's try something. Then I'm gonna I'm sending the login. Burp has intercepted the request. As you can see, it's, there are more inputs than I would think. I just thought that I put a username and a password, but it's sending the user agent, as we have seen earlier, the cookie and the session ID. So I will let the, this one go through because what I'm trying to do is brute force. And from HTTP history, I will send it to intruder. Okay. So I will ask uh, Burp to brute force the parameters I'm giving him. So it will just be the username 
and the password. We don't need to brute force the rest. And the attack will be cluster bomb. So I have two payloads, the username and the password that I'm going to change each time and try to understand if I can brute force it. So I can just try for, go for um, hacker, admin, uh, admin is traitor, system maybe, uh, uh, root, it, it might also work. So I tell it that, you know, on the first position, on the username, try these. And on the second position, for the passwords, you can just... Go ahead and try things like uh, admin. Yeah, so admin, admin, it happens. Uh, I don't know. ABC123, QRT123, uh, password. OK, so that should be enough. And then I just start the attack. OK, just because I'm using the demo version, it will give me a warning. But what it does now is to, uh, it tries, basically. OK, so just to, underst to understand how this worked. This was, the first one was my ba base request. So the request that I know doesn't work, this is the length of it. So I would think that if anything is different, in length, then I got a different reply. So he tried root as a username, password, uh, admin as a password, it didn't work. He tried system as a username, ABC123, it didn't work. And just by looking at the length of it, I can see that one of them is different. So what it got, uh, or I can just try it, same thing. So the username he sent was uh, admin and brute force, and the response was 200 OK, obviously. And yeah, it was able to log in. So this is why that uh, particular reply was different in size. This is an error in handling you know, uh, the user account because it allowed me to brute force it normally. It should not be. Errors in cryptography, so if each, is it using HTTPS while doing all this or is it doing it over regular HTTP? Things like that. There are several things that will help us keep our web applications secure. So any developers here today? People that code? Yeah. Okay, so maybe it could help you. Uh, we, knew we need to use, uh, well, these are buzzwords like uh, uh, defense in depth or fail securely, things like that. One, things that. one of the things that you can take to the bank is to run with least privilege. This is important. So we have seen that the web uh, database on the web server just now was run running as root on the localhost. So this is not something that you should do. Don't trust services, don't trust the infrastructure, don't trust the user input are the other things that you can uh, keep in mind. And of course, where we get paid as a penetration tester is <laughs> the report. So if you cannot provide the report, you don't get paid. It's easy as that. And there are several different types of people that will read the same report. So we need to be prepared for this situation. So there's the business owner, the manager that will read it. He doesn't understand technology. He doesn't care about technology. All he wants is, uh, all he cares about is his money. So we have to understand that people that do not care about, you know, whatever super hacking technique you have used uh, will also read the report. So, and there are technical people that will read the report. People, you know, like uh, you, sir, that will decoder, someone would tell you, okay, there's an SQL injection here, so please do this and that. 
system administrators or you know the sub technical supervisor will read the report he will uh, take care or he will care for other things just like you know this sentence here you can read it both ways I know it's an old thing but just uh, to remind you that people will read the same thing understand things differently and people will with different understandings we read uh, completely other things so the parts of the reports that we should have is an executive summary as I said the business owner will just you know flip through it maybe don't even read it it happened to me again a uh, government customer got hacked and this customer was having regular penetration tests so one every year and they lost all their databases with an SQL injection so someone just stole the entire database and I went to visit them the next day saying okay <laughs> sorry for you and I would just you know was curious okay you are having penetration tests every year but didn't anyone find this SQL injection before he said huh so that's what he, he had all the reports from the previous years in all of them it was written that the website had a SQL injection flow but no one you know explained him what it meant so he was just understanding how important it was and remediation advice of course we have to help the customer become more secure that's why they're uh, having us conduct the test in the first place the role map will help us you know show everyone or the customer what we did how we did it and you know if there is a control test that has to be done all these will be uh, shown in the roadmap it's the end of my boring presentation thank you very much for listening are there any questions yes sir how I okay uh, I studied banking and finance <laughs> and <laughs> my first uh, it was not a penetration that it was an illegal hacking attempt as I would say now I was you know playing with the system uh, of a bank and I liked it then I went to take a course uh, the certified ethical hacker I don't know yeah I think you have this certification so I went to that course got this certificate and then follows so it's not like I was 10 years old I was hacking systems now I'm not <laughs> like this I just any other questions okay if you have any questions you can find me on Gmail and Twitter just right yeah I'm here tomorrow again question oh I think it was that ministry who archived all their emails yeah because in the emails once you go through the emails usually you find mails like okay I'll be on holiday for two weeks here is the password and the username of my system so uh, maybe the biggest uh, just think, giving this example I audited a hospital and they had this hospital management system around 300 nurses and uh, each nurse was supposed to log in and write exactly I gave this medicament this medicine to that patient and the doctors as well and out of 300 users the system had only one user it was test and test because the company that you know made the proof of concept or the demo just came in they installed the system and they gave one user username test password test and then the hospital decided to buy the system I said okay just leave it like this and when people started asking each other well, so where do we get a password for this thing they did, oh, okay use test and test and for the last two years they had only one user and uh, this was I think the, the biggest failure <laughs> All right. now, they, now they have changed it they have changed <laughs> okay thank you very much